Welcome to the Safe Gardening Training designed for teach, lead, inspire, and transform. A overview of the contents of the presentation. So on the Safe Garden program, I've covered um, educating educators on different types of disease and bullying. Um, educating educators as well to spot those warning signs and how they can take care of the support services, advice and guidance, both for themselves and for young people, offering risk assessments, the opportunity to engage in safeguard training and get their qualifications in doing that. Um, I personally morally believe that all educators should have safeguard and training. I received safeguard and training myself in my university degree. An organisation called Canary Education educated me on the radicalisation of young people. However, this particular presentation has um, my own personal discovery and research origins. So, the aims and objectives that I have for this, um, for the outcome of this, is to make educators feel much more equipped to deal with reporting incidents and reporting things that are concerned to them. I think that safeguarding training can act as a prevent strategy. I'm also wanting to support my online petition to end child cruelty and are able to protect the quality of life for young people and children. So here I discuss the different types of cruelty and neglect. It's important to understand what we're, we're referring to specifically. So that way, when it comes to looking at the impact, the warning signs, and example cases, they all feel connected. So I think most people have a, at least a vague understanding of these things. So it's good to just go over these different types of things. So I think some of the obvious types of abuse would be physical, abuse, emotional abuse, and verbal abuse. When it comes to psychological abuse, the mind games, triangulation, coercive control, and abuse, those terminologies are explained in the glossary on the final slide. Um, when it comes to radicalization, just to be specific, that involves when a child is brainwashed to vote in terrorist state terrorism. This is quite a rare form of abuse, but it's still very, very serious. And it's what my prior safeguard training has allowed me to make the most focus on. The forced marriage, honor killing, and forced mutilation. Those three separate things are closely linked due to the fact that they can only result in extremely culturally informed beliefs. And um, when it comes to trafficking, again, Explanation is key. It explains that quite clearly. Um, that's something that generally happens over a long period of time, so we already know that this happens in states that we wouldn't know it happened. The child was so missing, so they would kind of have that indication that that is a possibility, and that's something that's become increasingly common. And all of the things listed are uh, criminal offences. Again, just um, drafting on the basics. Obviously, all types of child abuse will have an impact on the victim. I think it's important to take into consideration that whilst physical abuse is physical, it still has an emotional, emotional impact on the child. So, you know, that can be self esteem, um, sexual abuse. But, you know, again, that's another thing that's a physical thing that can be linked to those. Um, psychological impact and for the emotional and psychological abuse those are the forms of abuse really act as a base in the sense that all forms of abuse will have a negative emotional and psychological impact on the person and on their behavior again you know the impact between forced marriage and honor killing and emotional abuse can be 
kind of person like normalise these things or be quite rigid in their view of kind of these cultural norms essentially. Um, a lot of child abuse cases might not always see the impact that it has outwardly if it's been quite masked by the individual. But those warning signs can be subtle and they're often forced to be told on the fly. So just moving on to warning signs, um, this is really useful because a lot of young people might try to hide the warning signs or their abusers might just write them in a kind of silence. So physical abuse, warning signs, if a child is injured and it's, you know, there's not really a logical explanation for those injuries in the sense that you haven't seen them get injured or an injury has been happening within the time of the altercation, then that's a, um, a warning sign that it may be intentionally inflicted. Subtle signs may be difficulties with logical authority or poor understanding of boundaries. Child's very young and they've got an unusual level of knowledge about sexual activities or dangerous things, then that's also a, a warning sign to actually be warning signs of emotional verbal abuse for child typically emotional or has mood swings, so no apparent reason why what you're looking at has happened during the day within within the education system. Um, then I think that's also a warning sign to know that something's going on outside of what's been seen. Um, other signs of a bit both emotional, verbal and sexual low self-esteem in a child or young person if that's not directed at the bullying or the way that they're being taught by educators and staff then you have to then consider if those things are being ruled out that there has to be a reason why they feel that way and there is a possibility that it's linked to something that's going on at home. Female generation for sight on the teens again it can be really hard to recognise warning signs for that I think again if, if people are expressing extreme views or you know um, appear quite depressed but I think that's something that people generally keep quite secretive and I don't think that they talk about it very much so I think if you educate young people on safeguarding with the resources I've provided you, then you're more likely to come across that, but also across the PowerPoint with some links that detail that issue in more depth. Just to um, make sure that that understanding is even more in depth, I've provided some example cases. So there's been lots of cases in the news, whether in newspapers or television, about child abuse. Um, Obviously, it's a very sensitive subject within the child abuse discussion group, which is the reason why I provide some examples so that if you have a choice as to whether or not you want to view them as opposed to the bedroom floor as part of the PowerPoint. Um, there's also advice on female genital, genital mutilation um, on the third link, because obviously it's quite difficult to recognise signs of things like that. Um, on the killing of forced marriage just because it's been so deeply repressed and people tend to normalise those things as cultural links. Um, I think it's also important just to remember that Leicestershire Police are the main organisation that does NSPCC, which is Britain's leading organisation for any cause of children, suggests that if you believe that a child is in severe danger of abuse or contact with abuse. All these cases exemplified here the sense of radicalisation and also genital mutilation, forced marriage and honour killings, all those cases are extreme and they are life sentences and a lot of them are read safely. So if you become aware of those things you should definitely always contact the police. Institutional support so by institutional support, what we're referring to is whatever place of education is in the range of it's a school, a college, a university, a youth group, or anything else um, that involves teaching children and young people, 
your institution might offer counselling to the university that I came to that offer counselling to the university for mental health services, that offers mental support, that offers some skills, that offers how to do your job and there's plenty of students that will come to support for various different things. A lot of universities offer support and so you can access that by just clicking the support that you're wanting for teachers, for kids, but also it's really about the principle of the entire university or college or school if your peers and um, lower hierarchy staff aren't aware of the issue even in the hierarchy you can go right to the top and they will generally know what what you need to do um, institutional support can also involve informal contact for mental aspects now if a child tells you that that's incredibly concerning just follow your legal advice as well everything that you, you would do would, would you know abide with the law um leicestershire police has a lot of information about child protection laws um, if your concern isn't actually serious enough for a legal case to be started or for an investigation to be followed through then your local child protection service would actually tell you that on its own i think it's better to get an objective opinion from someone that's experienced in that field rather than someone's opinion like a colleague or a friend which might be biased because they know the people they know the parents they know the people that are involved in the situation or have these facts and feelings um every single city in the uk has its own local child protection organization which involves a website with a contact number and email address so whatever your local county is so for instance i live in leicester if i type into the into the google search engine Less the child protection services phone number, a phone number would immediately appear. You can keep your name anonymous if you want to. Um, what they would do is they'd ask you a series of questions. They're taking taking your concern. If your concern's not serious enough, they would tell you that it's it's not something they're going to follow through. If the investigation is followed through, they would tell you as well. Um, and if you wanted your name kept anonymous no parent and that child wouldn't find out that you were the one that made the phone call so i think again reporting abuse is something that a lot of people feel quite anxious about doing but if you click on the link at the bottom leicester shire official police made it clear that it's not against the law to actually report child abuse that's just something that the law wants you to do if there's child abuse is a criminal offence and like i said you know, investigations are carried out through child protection services. So if they don't find any evidence to make a case, then it won't. There won't be any consequences if, you know, if it isn't a child abuse case and it's just a mistake or, or something like that. There are many counselling services that you can get externally or counselling services outside of your place of education, and these groups are always not playing the same. So you can see at the bottom, better help, still mental health, and NHS mental health. I provided some links there. Um, those services offer offer support for free. There's also the organisation Talk, which is an organisation for mental health. Um, it's a very broad organisation. Lots of things that they do. I think the balance of my organisation which looks at helping young people to speak out about certain issues, more so pioneering uh, formal recovery process. I think it's also important to remember that simple things like a therapy mentorship in yourself can be just as impactful in some cases, not all cases, but some. And even things such as allocating assistive and support to student mentor, I know that some places of education, such as schools, you might have, you know, maybe a 14-year-old student that becomes a mentor for a nine-year-old student. 19 year old student becomes a mentor for a 16 year old student so if you trust a mature student to be a role model for younger students then the older student gets some experience out of that as well as a younger person having that positive example and in that way it saves your time if you don't have the time to provide that mentorship but i believe that that mentorship should be embedded into teaching anyway
and I think the this safeguarding program that I've created will be good for enabling people to feel more comfortable with being out. So in terms of further advice and guidance, so obviously I've provided you the advice and guidance myself, but I think there's more advice and guidance out there outside of what I've provided you. Um, so this is just some other um, approaches out there. So NSPCC is the leading organisation, change.org, um, my online petition looks at risk assessments being mandatory. So I think that risk assessments and being a reporter is deemed to be mandatory in all schools, colleges and universities in the UK. Um, and again, you know, um, all these organisations provide definitions, advice and guidance, such as finding innovative for children. Leicester Safeguarding Adult Board to rate things in young people, so you've got one for children and one for young people. So whatever you click on will just be based on what you think is more, more relevant to your situation or concern. Again, I briefly did mention the law, but the very bottom link, the very bottom two links are just Leicestershire, which is the child exploitation um, system, and down from the bottom, Leicestershire is the child exploitation guide. I think the very bottom one is actually the most important, so that's child number one. It has the sort of guidance, Leicestershire, which is the obligation for the landlines on how to report it. Um, obviously, I agree with you on that prior, but you would make that again in writing to your, your landlord to take note of that. And even if you don't live in Leicester, if you're not Leicester based or Leicester based citizen, those laws still apply throughout the UK and the UK. And your own city will have its own policing website that they can rely upon. So, for Leicestershire, which is the use tax law, which is the one that we've seen before, um, if it's a then the above is more relevant. Stay away children, solicitors will be on children that may be homeless, and this is not going to be a case of children that may be homeless, this is a case of children that may be unique, which is fine. Why can't we manage the unique? And I think it's also important to mention that there are lots of links with organisations around child abuse. It's a global issue, it's going on all over Europe, all the countries. And and so there's always going to be laws to protect you as a non-based citizen that may be homeless. So now that your knowledge has been elevated through that program, I think it's important to mention that risk assessment is really another thing that's really, really key. Working with groups of young people has never worked with before as well. I think it's quite useful in that scenario. You can do a risk assessment months, every three months, every week, every day that you feel in, it, it kind of depends on what you what you get from the first risk assessment. I think if you get a lot of concern, then you should maybe again you've been that's just part of the legacy where you just ask people to get in touch with you and you just keep on soliciting to get them to put it in. If you didn't get that much concern for the first time around, then that's just a more safe start. Um obviously the convenience and Time. But you could even be emailed to just make it more confidential and you could fill out those risk assessments without them being around each other. So there's lots of different types of risk assessments. If people refer with unit risk assessments, they'll be either very specific and things to involve considering your own safety in particular. Um, there's risk assessments for juvenile institutions, for prisons for young people. Um, Anti-bullying is a good type of risk assessment. Ending child cruelty, outdoor choreography hazards, and so forth. And I've provided all of those within the presentations so that you'll be able to um, use those and, and have a look at what they have to offer. So now that I've mentioned types, we'll just go over some guidelines. So with the way that the presentation works. 
I would say that in terms of how to use the form, there's different levels of risk. There's low, there's medium, and there's high. There's also no risk as a possibility. Um, and, and they're the levels that you need to look at. It keeps things nice and brief, um, and it, it makes it very easy to assess risk. So to be specific, just so you understand the symbols, the N symbolises and means no risk or means of harm. L means low risk. M means medium risk and H means high risk. So you see that in the table, you know what it represents. No risk is also equivalent to zero. Low risk is equivalent to one to two. Medium is three and high risk is four to five. So really going from zero to five. I just wanted to mention that risk onto the extreme of things like suicide, hospitalisation, are risk factors and most people in those categories that are involved, particularly homophobic reasons. And um, this doesn't really apply as much to chronology as hazard. So I think again it's a very different type of risk assessment, which is why I've chosen to keep them separate. Um, just remember that the possibility of warning signs just makes me risk assessment. The warning signs you recognise might be different from the examples that I've provided. Um, I think the examples are just there to stimulate your thinking outside the box, but you might find other examples outside of the ones that I've provided, and, and that's still very valid. And this is where you can kind of make your own risk assessment, you can use mine as a template for making your own risk assessment as well. So this particular risk assessment is mainly in direct relation to issues of um, child abuse. So this is to do with different warning signs, level of risk, potential consequences, and prevention strategies. So we mentioned different types of abuse. One particular warning sign might be something like an open appearance, dirty or unmarried clothes, wearing formal clothes, etc. And then you've got the different levels of risk. The potential consequences of child or sexual outcasted, unmedical or unmedical child, feeling uncomfortable, participating in sexual activity. I think the stigma of parents and parents abusing is quite a preventable strategy. Obviously, if there's no parents abusing a child, we can probably discuss this in terms of parenting directly in a sensitive manner. And so that's really more for neglect. Moving on, physical abuse is an unexplained or reasonably practical ground. The child doesn't want to be ground to make anything. You can level the risk on the level of injury and on the level of whether or not it's likely to happen to you later on in life. And then you find out you've lost a child and what your life is now. I think having first aid tracks trained back is a good idea for this prevention strategy. I think having first aid Discuss the things both individually and collectively to see how you're preventing. You could also offer external or internal counselling and mentoring services. In terms of potential consequences of having child sex abuse as well, children have a capacity well as an adult for physical abuse. It's important to take the physical matter seriously. It appears to be that other options are ruled out. Um, another warning sign of abuse is problematic behaviour. Now, problematic behaviour can be quite about unless are typical of young adults and young children. So, potential consequences might be restricted learning experience for others, so aggressive behaviour learning, causes stress and difficulty, poor communication and community support, and poor social behaviour. Prevent strategies may involve talking therapy, mentorship. I think the more likely to change the behaviour from the standpoint of feeling psychology support for that, additionally seeing a psychiatrist or psychologist, um, having the child work with staff or counselling and, and things of, of that nature. Um, another warning sign can be violent or threatening behaviour. Now it's important to recognise that this behaviour might be rare and unfounded or unreported. It also might not be, it might be learned from a peer in school someone else but I think it's important to remember that it has to be from somewhere if you've ruled out the, the other options so it might be the level of what they've been exposed to 
providing mentorship to supervise the child um, if things are a danger or weak with concentration. Some sort of mentorship that has a positive role model might have a positive influence on their behaviour. It could be involved with family culture. This could prevent further escalation of antisocial problems in the future. By becoming an antisocial mentor or allocating to a mentor, you can give a picture of the child's behaviour. Are the warning signs of neglect involved? Rapid weight loss or a child that's also quite mentally weakened. A child particularly ravenous at school or overeats, this could lead to our concentration or lack of mentorship within the home. Now, children who are deprived of nutrition are more likely to develop eating disorders. Question the child's portion sizes and hunger levels, whether they're having a three meal a day, make sure they're having a healthy balanced diet. Some schools have a breakfast club. You could suggest this. Again, if you're school based or college based, if your parents use meals, you can just substitute for that. If you're working in higher education, speak with the young person in a sensitive manner or allocate someone else to do so who knows them better, or you could email them about the matter. So, in terms of prevent strategies, any GP will tell you that sleep, diet, and drink are our basic needs to function. So, lack of any of these things can cause significant issues for health and well being. Furthermore, if it's a young person who's maybe recently started living independently, going through those things, a flow chart for the child or young person to use as a tick sheet can also be useful so that way they can tick off that they've done those basic things. Is for choreography for life performance or any other type of choreographic project. I've created this um, risk assessment form on my own just like all of the other ones. Um, so there's different types of outdoor hazards that you want to take into consideration when you are choreographing work outdoors. So for example, sharp things on the floor such as breaking glass, alcohol bottles might be thrown on the floor by pedestrians the night before. Risks include deep touching of the skin, it needs hospital treatment. Um, if you leave it untreated, it can actually get infected and can lead to amputation, which is an extremely severe risk. So I think prevent strategies involve check the floor, check the surroundings, and always wear shoes unless you've covered the floor. This also in, in you know applies if you've got soft things on the floor like mud and dirt, you still need to wear shoes because you could get infected by dirt and those things. Um, it's not hygienic. If there's excretions on the floor, again, it's a surface to cause infection, make sure you wear shoes. And also, if you're using your hands on the floor, you might want to look at what you're wearing. Latex gloves. Now, the passers-by are not really a hazard, but if the person doesn't want to be filmed and you're filming footage, you should know that it's probably a legal offence them without their consent, even if they're just acting or living in the frame. You need to make sure you choose an area that's free of passers by. If you are quite early in the morning or quite late in the evening, it's, it's less likely that there's going to be people, but there are also areas of land such as countryside and forests and things like that that tend to have more remote areas as well. And that looks very nice on camera. And um, dangerous passers by, so this could involve drunk people. Severely unstable people, people with different sorts of severe mental health issues. You might get approached for money, you might get harassed. The best thing to do is walk away, choose a different location, or come back another day. Never go on your own. And if the harassment's quite serious, then you need to even contact the police. Weather. Now, if the floor is slippery, as there's sort of snow, rain, or ice, then obviously you can't be falling or injured. It's best to wear shoes that have strong grip, or you cover the floor with some boots if you're going through, you know, the winter season and it's kind of like the heat of day. Then it's best to cover the floor with like a plastic coating. Um, location: if you're using private land or land owned by the council, then that's going to be an issue because if you find it recommended, ask the council to make you first and also be aware of the surroundings. Consider if you're on private land or you're near a garden. Physical obstacles, it could be anything such as uneven flooring, you could get injured, good to bring the person 
is to do practice oneself. That way you can see how that grounding feels for you. Go to the studio, dance on stairs, make sure that it's got a, a rail. If there's no rail, then you can still use those stairs if you think you're careful enough to make sure you, you know, so you practice first and you show that you've got a first aid on hand. This risk assessment specifically looks at different types of bullying. So um, some injury that is causing in a way. So in terms of in group outbreak, it's really a psychological terminology that involves social influence. So this is where employers they want to fit in. So even if School, you should consider the possibility that if a peer group is in a particular way, you might follow along with that behaviour to fit in, even if they don't agree with that behaviour. So I think warning signs include if you notice a shift in a person's behaviour, they're not being their usual self, it might be a sign that they need to be evaluated. So, in terms of this, it kind of trains in people to not think for themselves, often triangulating. Role. I'll discuss what that psychological terminology is further on. This affects one's ability to trust others as effectively. So you can definitely see there how in group outbreak can have a, it's more ranging from none to three, in my opinion, or four to five. But in group outbreak can sometimes serve as the foundation for the intervention bullying knowledge on a risk assessment. So prevent strategies involve discuss group think and psychological terminology with young people. So I think again, if you make them aware of it, they're probably going to realise there are lots of situations like that. So group think is really when a person thinks of themselves and thinks like a group. Sometimes it's seen as a strength, but if the group is trying to get a child or young person to do things they wouldn't normally do, then in those situations it can become less of a strength, more of a weakness. Body shaming. So this is kind of obviously it's somebody who's being targeted because of the way their body is. Um, young people often concerned with body image. This is a very common thing. I think you all probably noticed that. The level of risk, I would say the main risk with body shaming is the child or young person having a eating disorder or brainwashing. I think educating young people on how to nutrition is a core part of this curriculum. Discussing any concerns with young people, but having that knowledge on health and nutrition is definitely something that could combat eating disorders. Again, it's a very complex and in deep subject, and one that I've studied extensively. So, if you want any further information on that, then you can contact myself. LGBTQ discrimination, I think, again, warning signs and symptoms like a lot of things. A young person is isolated at all their mental health levels. Person might feel ashamed or confused. There are a lot of in cases of suicide in the context of LGBTQ discrimination, which is something I've discovered through being told by LGBT Stonewall at a conference. So, prevent strategies might in include referring young people. So, there are lots of LGBT groups that have a well into treatment letter, especially one in every single city in the UK. You could also contact LGBT Stonewall through their website and reach all UK schools and provide um, guidance and support for both students and, and teachers in relation to LGBT issues. Racial abuse and, and slurs. Um, if you spot racism, you should definitely just confront the issue, discuss the importance of diversity, equality, and inclusion to your students. Your organisation match policies and they include no discrimination acts or rules. Make sure students are aware that such incidents can be reported. Risks include people feeling uncomfortable or marginalised. They may feel they've been judged on their ask or appearance basis and should set their own personality and their choices. Sexism, if this is more based on rigid stereotypes, often rigid stereotypes about men and boys are harmful. Some men are dangerous, but not all men are dangerous, and not most either. Um, sexually degrading comments, particularly towards women, I will just 
can also happen to men. Just be aware that sexism can actually happen to anybody, regardless of their gender, whether they're male, female, or something else. Um, and depression and anxiety are the common consequences of it. Um, I would say to prevent strategy, discuss the importance of equality and diversity, make sure you're aware that incidents can be reported, maybe on your policy that there's a no discrimination act. Discrimination against religion or culture. It's common but not limited to certain types of people like Muslim terrorists. These beliefs are definitely not true. And they're very harmful in younger children. Um, they're also very common in younger children. So a lot of children in school begin to believe things like that, but we know that this is definitely not true. Um, this can lead to social isolation, which is a common cause of depression. So prevent strategies include again teaching people on diversity, but also you need to teach them the concept of individuality and that everyone is unique and therefore you can't stereotype people into these boxes. Superficial. Again, this is kind of one that I've made myself. Um, so it's highly common and it involves young people using in group out group like thinking. But in this context, it's kind of for all the wrong reasons, someone not being fashionable enough or rich enough or looking the same as everyone else. So levels of risk and warning signs might involve things like, well, I think warning signs will involve the peer groups are very separate in your class, people hang in similar crowds, or everyone who wants to dress gothic hang out together, people with the same hair colour hang out together, those sort of things. Prevent strategies involve um, teaching people terminology um, and teaching people that it's, it's the inside that counts, it's the inside that's important. This risk assessment focuses more on different types of injuries that might be considered from within the studio context and not outdoors. So bruising, this is superficial in anatomy, superficial on the surface, superficial on the other table from more of a psychological context. So in anatomical context, bruising and cuts and aches can from superficial injuries that cause a deeper injury into the bones and the ligaments. Mind you, the muscles wrap around the bones and protect them. So it's deeper injuries on, on the bones and, and the ligaments that are considered deeper injuries, which is the opposite. So bruising and cuts are lower, but cuts can worsen the contraction of the spine. Bruising can cause irritation to a damp surface of the scratching, so if the bruises are being rubbed against the surface of the floor. I think it's important to remember that this is actually avoidable. You wear layers to protect the contract of the skin, the transition in that the floor with the protection of the meat explained in the prevention strategies. Muscle aches. After a long physical training session, you feel aches again. This process anatomically is the muscle fibers become stronger and more flexible. It often heals fast. This isn't the same thing as a sprain. There's a difference between muscle aches and sprains. The only thing on this list that I've really had is muscle aches. And I find that those heal very, very fast, but it could be a result of my hygiene and my impact on diet because those things are scientifically proven to improve muscle and bone mass. I would say in order to avoid sprains and fractures and other things, consider the intensity of your warm-up, consider the type of mild stretches and gradual increases of difficulty, but also make sure that you actually do something that's going to warm your body up like cardio or plyometrics before you move on to under stretching so that the muscles are prepared for that. Bone fractures and dislocations are much more serious, might involve things popping out of place, can be determined through an x ray. Um, if this happens, you need to sit out, do some theory, get cleared by the doctor. And when it comes to things like sharp nails, you can wear them if you soften them down, have the edges softened, but it won't be sharp. I'd suggest bringing the first aid kit. You could also obviously just not wear them and avoid incapacity by not using tape over 
in the class. Here I've conducted you with a glossary of psychological terms. So most of these terms are self-pioneered, um, which has come practice in psychology. So mentioned in group out group, it's really a very deliberate thing where young people have to make the conscious decision about who is a good enough and deserving to be in a social group. Sometimes the young people don't actually know that much about the people in the room. It might be in the first group of time. In the context of superficial, it's for the wrong reasons. And it's something things like physical outward appearance rather than personality. But in group out group can be for the right reasons, such as individuals connecting with each other because of the fact that they have similar interests. To be teaching by a training course, it's important to note that people will share similar interests anyway and to consider that superficial could be happening. Um, we discussed group thinking previous. Deflection is when a person imitates the behaviour of their abuser to normalise the abuse in order to remain in denial. This tactic is often used in child abuse, racism, and homophobia cases. So basically, what a person's doing is they're being abused. Um, it's difficult for them to accept that they're being abused because that concept is distressing to them. So they remain in denial to protect themselves emotionally, and sometimes that might involve mirroring back the behaviour of the abusers where it's normal. So influence can be linked as well. Triangulation is when three individuals play off one another. For example, Chloe tells Dean that Sandy doesn't like him. This causes issues between Dean and Sandy. Sandy then tells Chloe Dean said unkind things and Dean tells Chloe Sandy said mean things. This is all going on behind each other's back and nobody in the group knows it's happening. From the outside looking in, you might recognise it as a third party who isn't in the group. Now, this happens all the time. It happens in the workplace, it happens in school, and it's very common. Hexagonation is the exact same concept as triangulation, but with six people, and that triangulation would involve four. Octangulation, same concept as the above, but involves eight people or more. In these big peer groups, things get complicated and messy. No one in the group knows why. It could be one person doing it two or every one. Um, now, obviously, another classic example of this is if you ever watch reality TV where you're kind of on the outside, you can kind of see that these groups are playing off one another and this happens a lot in education and you're more likely to know this than the outside than they are. Think of more of like a circulation. In circulation, there's not really any points to connect. So in that case, it's more of a sort of cyclical relationship that's more where everybody's connected yeah. to each other. So there is the chance of gaining qualifications through all of this. So my safeguarding programmes are free of cost and they come in different levels. So I've used the traffic amber alert system as analogy. So level one, yellow reward, it's called the technology award. Level two, orange reward. Level three is red award, and level four is green award. So basically, as a result of completing all four levels, we have an in depth understanding of safeguarding. I would cover things like people referral units, special needs schools, disabilities, juvenile detention centres, and just a few other things that haven't been touched upon in this particular um, safeguarding method. I'd also go into case studies in more specific detail in this particular youth group. And just getting more and more specific with more examples. Um, you would have to fill out a questionnaire in relation to what you've been taught to make sure the knowledge is there. And you'd have to pass that questionnaire in order to make it happen. Now you can, there's different levels of passing, but it's a pass to make distinction board. So if you could get distinction looking at anywhere from 75% or so of accurate answers and a pass, you'd need to get a 55 and a merit would be somewhere in the middle at around 60. So there's a specific assessment criteria that I use. Um, you'd also get a reference to this, that as well, separate from the certificate. It just summarises what that 
specifically involved you covering what you've got. Obviously, level one isn't as advanced as level four, but by level four, you've done level one, two, three, and four. So in order to do the level four and get the green award, you would compulsory have to have done the other ones anyway, because it would be more in depth, it'd be more detailed. To get the yellow award, it would just be a questionnaire relating to something that you've learned now. So I would suggest if you've watched this entire thing, I'd personally suggest contacting me for the questionnaire for me to then mark and then send you your certificate. It would look fantastic on your CV. I think it's safe going, it's really underrated. So I think it makes sense to, you know, for me to make this because safeguarding is it's often skimmed through, it's very briefly mentioned, it's very rare that you find a thorough, in-depth safeguarding education that targets all areas of safeguarding in one place. I've never seen that before. And to get a free certificate, I think, you know, you've spent time watching this presentation, you've, you've understood the different concept. I think that makes complete sense. Um, and also it's for free and it looks fantastic on your CV. So the unique learning number, class serial number, so that way no one can say that they have your certificate. So obviously the unique learning number, say for example, if it's just a random bunch of numbers and letters, F, Z, Q, Q, something like that, it's on my system. I'll create a website that has all of those names on it people that have done my training program and that way it's a formal thing um and so again i've actually got a safeguard certificate myself as a serial number on it from now education but their safeguarding program is only in radicalization and didn't cover anything about child cruelty or bullying which are also issues that you're dealing with as an educator you might have young people that have completed their own lives or who are being targeted and obviously we've got to keep correct to bullying and I think in our new award we start to go more in depth into different examples and case studies of those types of bullying as well. Um, there's a little bit of written work and there's a questionnaire but it's not something that takes any longer than 20 minutes or so to fill out. So this entire presentation has been completely self-made and it was a lot of And thank you for participating, for being learning and being open minded and for learning the tips and that you need to learn. And the reason why I'm offering it for free is because it's so important. So you can contact me on my formal business email. Um, I can provide you on further information on my other organisations, which are also on my website. So on my website, I have um, a lot of links to these particular other organisations for stop suffering in silence you've already been exposed to some of that because that's kind of the child cruelty movement talk emotion is in relation to physical disabilities and limitations talking to those in decision relating to people of colour different nationalities talk emerge is the bank artists who are transitioning maybe into university or out of the university looking for careers advice. Um, Roadmap to Recovery is a trauma recovery program that helps survivors of child abuse or different types of bullying to recover from those issues. And Empower Youth Bank Company is aimed at rehabilitating children from abuse and violence. So you can see here that there's a lot of overlap and it all has multiple different subcategories. And then you've got my recovery program and my empowerment response company. So you know that I also offer services that could be of great use um, to you as, as well as some of the services that I've mentioned, external outside of myself. Thank you.